thinking about uh, what God would have us to learn as a church uh, concerning Thanksgiving. I looked up uh, thankfulness in the uh, in the Psalms and looked for the most um, mentions of the word thanks or thanksgiving. And so a few Psalms stuck out to me. One of those is Psalm 50. And so we're going to look at Psalm 50 uh, this afternoon. I uh, did this study last night on Zoom uh, for our prayer meeting. And so those of you that couldn't make it or I want to share this with others, I thought I'd record this uh, so you would have it. And twice in this Psalm, uh, we are encouraged to offer God, the mighty God, what he really, really wants. And that is Thanksgiving. So Psalm 50 starts with uh, a question. So verses one to six answers this question, who is calling or who is speaking? And let's see what we can learn from Psalm 50, verse 1. The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes. He does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire, around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me, my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. And we'll stop there with the first uh, stanza, so to speak, in this psalm of thanksgiving. Uh, it doesn't sound quite like thanksgiving yet, but it's not uh, meant to uh, at the beginning here. God is uh, showing us himself. And what do we see about God in verses 1 to 6? He is a glorious, mighty judge. And he's calling, not in silence in verse 3, and around him is this devouring fire and mighty tempest. So he comes in great display of power and glory to, uh, for those to watch in fear. And he calls to his people in verse 4. So all around the earth uh, for his people to come to his faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. So these people are faithful to God's Old Testament sacrifices, and they're coming and offering God's sacrifices. And in the New Testament, we have a new covenant that is um, God's faithful people. Uh, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, we gather as God's people to remember the new covenant, which is a covenant with Christ's blood. And so both the Old and New Testament were covenants, uh, agreements with God and his people, uh, sealed with blood, Old Testament blood of animals, and New Testament, the blood of Christ. And so we come as God's people, faithful to him in the New Testament, and he's calling us to come to him. And in verse 6, it says, the heavens declare his righteousness. Psalm 19, 1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And one facet of God's glory is his righteousness, which means he always does what's right. He is the standard for what is right, and especially we want him to do what's right when it comes to judging. And God himself is the judge. And so he's going to judge his people in particular, and that's us. And how, uh, who does he call to then in verse seven? He calls to his people who are uh, faithful to him in offering him uh, sacrifices. And so um, the second uh, stanza here, verses seven to 13, uh, is uh, seven verses, and it speaks of uh, God uh, calling his faithful, and he is saying to those who want to learn, I want something from you, and we're going to uh, look at that in verses 14 and 15, but let's see what he says to them. He says, here are my people in verse seven, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. When we hear that phrase, testify against you, we're like, oh no, something's wrong, or I did something wrong, and they surely did. Verse 8, not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills, and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? So what is God asking the Israelites here as they come and listen to him to learn? What is he, he's testifying against them. 
in this. He's saying you are consistently bringing offerings in verse 8. So they're consistent in bringing offering. That sounds like they're faithful to God. But he says, I'm not going to accept your sacrifices because I don't need them. Why doesn't God need sacrifices? And this is Old Testament, whenever they were supposed to come three times a year with sacrifices. He says, because I own the whole world and I don't really eat the blood of bulls or goats or, uh, or I need them at all. I own everything. So God owns the whole world. So why does he call his people? What does he want to teach them? Well, he testifies against them, verses 7 to 13. And then verses 14 and 15, he's teaching. And this is why we chose this psalm for a Thanksgiving psalm, because uh, here is the faithful people who are giving God what they think he wants, but what he really wants, he's going to teach them what he really wants. And here's what he teaches us as God's faithful people in the New Testament. This is what he wants as well. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High or obey what you said you're going to do. Um, be a people of your word. Verse 15, and call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. So he calls us to thankfulness, obedience, and then trust. So God says, here's what I want. I don't need or want your sacrifices. I'm glad you're obeying, but I don't need those because I own everything. Here's what I really want of you, my people, who want to be faithful to me. I want you to offer me a sacrifice of thanksgiving. I want you to, what you've promised me, performing your vows, I want you to be people of your word because I'm the most high God. And then I want you to call upon me in the day of trouble. Does it seem like 2020 is filled with trouble? It is like day after day after day and trouble after trouble after trouble. And you think it can't get any worse and it gets worse. Well, God expects us in 2020 to call upon him in the day of trouble. Why? Because he's the most high God. Who are we calling to? He's the God who's our judge. He's the God whose heavens declare his righteousness. He's the God who is not keeping silent, who is mighty in power. He's the mighty one in verse 1. He is God. He is the Lord, uh, the covenant-keeping God of verse 1. And he's a glorious God in verse 2. And so we are encouraged by our God to give him thanksgiving and obedience and to ask God for help in trouble. And what's it say in verse 15? When you do that, I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. So God says, here's what I want my faithful people to do. Of all the people on heaven and earth, I want to bring you to myself. And here's what I want from you. I want your thanksgiving. And I want you to call on me in the day of trouble. And when you do that, I will deliver you out of trouble. And when I deliver you out of trouble, you're going to praise me or glorify me. This is what God wants. In the first stanza here of... God speaking in verses 7 to 15, we see that God wants our trust and our thanks. The next uh, seven verses, 16 uh, to 22, God is going to testify against the wicked. So it's probably the uh, those who were outwardly doing what God said, and now those who are outwardly disobeying. These are God's people. These are people who have uh, are in a covenant with God, and as we in the New Testament are related to God through Christ, um, we can be wicked as well, and our righteous judge sees through our outward spirituality. So what does he say in verse 16? But to the wicked God says, what right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? So these people are talking like they know God. They could be in church and singing uh, the praises, or uh, remembering the Lord's death and communion, or uh, paying attention to the word of God, or giving of tithes and offerings in a worship service. And we can go through the motions, but we can be wicked in our heart, and God the judge knows if our worship is wicked. Verse 17, how does God know if our worship is wicked? Because how we live in private, and how we look at his word. Look at verse 17, for you hate discipline, and you cast my words behind you. And discipline is a, a rebuke, a, a soft discipline, not a harsh 
uh, discipline, but a, a rebuke, a uh, getting people back in line. And uh, God does that for the wicked, his people who are wicked. And then he gives them words. Of course, he's speaking throughout this psalm. And when God speaks, we can cast his words behind us. We can read the word and not remember anything. We can listen to sermons and not retain anything because God's word's not important to us. And we have to make sure that we're not wicked uh, and be like this. Verse 18, if you see a thief, you are pleased with him and you keep company with adulterers. These are God's people who are acting wickedly and enjoying uh, people who are breaking God's law and keeping company with adulterers, those who are unfaithful to God and their spouse. Verse 19, you give your mouth free reign for evil and your tongue frames deceit. So these people are lying and, uh, and using their tongue for all types of evil. This is outward, um, outward blatant disobedience against God. And then verse 20, you sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. This is unnatural for you to go after people in your family. It sounds like the Corinthians, the first Corinthians 3, uh, whenever uh, Paul rebukes them as being uh, babies in Christ. And so um, these wicked people aren't thanking God and they're living uh, wicked lives, even though they are God's people. Verse 21, these things you have done and I have been silent. You thought that I was one like yourself or that I approved of your actions. And why are these people living wicked lives, even though they're God's people, is they have a wrong view of God. They change God to be an affirming God instead of a judge, a holy, righteous God. And when we change God, we'll um, excuse ourselves from all kinds of sin. But now I rebuke you, he says in verse, end of verse 21, and lay the charge before you. So he's testifying and laying this charge before them they're guilty. Verse 22, mark this, then you who forget God, lest I tear you apart and there be none to deliver. So he promised deliverance to those who called on him in trouble back in verse 15. And here he says, if you continue your wicked ways and you don't listen to my rebuke, you keep casting my word behind you and you keep living wicked lives, you're doing this because you think I approve of this or I'm just like you and you forget God, and we can't forget God. If we do, God will tear us apart, and there will be none to deliver us, because no one is mightier than the mighty God. So God promises judgment for his people uh, who are unfaithful to him, even though they may be outwardly faithful to him, uh, but inwardly and in private, they are uh, wicked. But here is this idea of hope, that there is a chance for these people to repent because if they can hear this rebuke and they agree with God then and they choose not to forget God then God won't tear them apart and they God will deliver them so crying to God in trouble uh, is even available to uh, wicked people and that is great cause for thanksgiving look at verse 23 the one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me so what would the wicked have to be thankful for in this psalm? That God has revealed how wicked they really are and the solution to their wickedness. God has showed us what, how wicked we are with the Ten Commandments and all the commandments that we break. And God has showed us his salvation in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Word. And God in these last days has spoken to us through his Son, the Word. And if we will listen to Christ, if we will call on him in the day of trouble, and we will thank our God. That glorifies God. And look at it into verse 23. To one who orders his way rightly, he wants to obey God. I will show the salvation of God. And when God shows you uh, salvation, you have great cause for thankfulness. And this psalm, even though it sounds like a rebuke, and it is, uh, but God doesn't want us to reject his word. He doesn't want to destroy us. He's telling us this will happen, but he's telling us the solution. And he teaches us. He teaches us how to turn from sin and how to thank our God and how to trust in our God. And when we fear our God and we turn from evil, 
uh, our lives should be characterized by thanksgiving and obedience. And these two things is what God wants from us as we um, come to this uh, time in our year, in our lives, that we've had a pretty difficult year as a church. And uh, so many people are, are struggling emotionally. And you need the uh, scripture from Psalm 50 to remind us who's really in charge. And when he comes to judge, will he find us faithful? Will he find in us a thankful heart and obedient lives? Or will he cause, uh, will he have to rebuke us and we'll have to turn from our sin? I may God uh, challenge us to please him with thanksgiving and obedience.